you were born where? I was born in Voorheesville on Prospect okay. Street with uh, my grandmother as midwife and the doctor. Uh -huh. And that was in your father's house? Uh, yeah. Uh, so you, you, how did you get that house? Do you, do you know? Well, he bought it. And you got a loan from? He got a loan from the Voorheesville Savings and Loan. $600 loan. <laughs> I didn't know much about it. I had to learn about it from you. <laughs> What kind of work did your father do, Mike? Well, he, he started before he came to Voorheesville. He was in Rosetta, Pennsylvania. He was on the mines. He, he run 10 boilers for steam, for power for the mines. He was a very good boiler man. He make, made steam. And then he came here and he went to work at Voorheesville Casting Company as a night watchman. And he took care of the boilers. He was very good at it. He knew his business. Uh -huh. Although he couldn't read or write, he could, he could manage the things he had to do. Now, didn't he work at the railroad at one time? Well, for a while. Yeah, what did he do in the railroad? Well, just a laborer. Mm -hmm. Lay the ties, weed, fix broken rails, whenever they had them. I noticed from the picture in the book that most of the people in that picture were Italians who worked for the railroad. Yeah, there were others were there? came on later on, mm -hmm. like Gifford and, well, I forget the other guy's name. Mm -hmm. There were others that came in after we did, some Irish people. Schufelt Schu uh -huh. was on, and some of them guys, some of the farmers used to work part-time. Yeah. Now, the street you lived on, Don Lentley referred to, and I've heard you say uh, Macaroni Alley. Spaghetti Alley. Spaghetti Alley. Well, what, what, is, what, do you, what does that mean, Spaghetti Alley? Well, we had three or four, three families, four families of Italians. Out of about six houses. Uh -huh. And what made it special? Uh, was it especially the Italian neighborhood? Or? Well, not really, but well, you could say that because we were mostly uh, alone up there, just uh, on that street. It was just uh, outside of the village, you might as well say, but it was close enough that we were in the village. Now, you and I have talked a couple of times about your mother making bread and pizza and oh, making yeah. home from the war. Describe that a little bit. What, what, what did she do to, to make bread and stuff? What, what was the process? Well, we made bread for, we used to have boarders, more, more people. We had family. We had eight. My grandmother lived with us. And we'd take in a boarder, come from the old country to give them a place to stay. <laughs> And she'd bake, bake bread, cook. We had chickens that we used for barter, sell the eggs and get meat. We didn't have very much money, but we, we never saw a day without something to eat, as poor as we were. Mm -hmm. We always, though I can remember, we always had something to eat, no matter whether my father was working or not, we managed they had a way of, in their way of living, to know what to do. Mm -hmm. and, and how, what do you remember about your mother making bread? Oh. How, how, what was the process? Well, she, she had this big pan, wash basin, that used to use them for washing clothes, but she bought one special for that. And that was her to keep, she used to clean up like a, a real trooper. Mm -hmm. she, she had linens to put on the, after we made the bread dough. She did her, she made the, the dough and then put it in there to rise. Then she'd leave, put it by the heater, by the radiator, or by the stove when we had stove on. And it would rise overnight and then she'd get up early, five o'clock, and make her bread. 
get her pans filled, and then she'd light the, the oven, and then she, she, she'd go in between. We'd help her bring the pans out. She had a, lay, a spatula that would put them in the oven. She'd clean it all out, hose it down, bop it out. She was very fussy, boy. <laughs> Well, Mike, describe that oven. See, people who were seeing this wouldn't know what that oven was. Well, the oven was it set up high, even with your chest. And you'd put the fire right in there. They had what they call fire brick. My Uncle Sam made, the, made this. He, that was his business. He, he took the blocks and put it up there. And, and they got fire brick that hold it. Used to, she used to wait till it got white with the heat. Mm -hmm. Then she knew that she had to take the, she raked the flames out, the coals out, put them in a pail, would take them out in the garden. And then she'd throw a little flour down to see how it would brown. She had her, that was her system mm -hmm. of thermometer. Instead of, she didn't have no, no thermometer, she used her own system about how how hot it was. She'd know by the burning of the flour whether it was too hot or whether it was just right. If it would tan, just the flour would turn tan, then she'd put her bread in. And she had a time. If she was busy, we were around, she'd say, go, right, go, go take the bread out. She knew just exactly what she was doing. Well, how many loaves would she make on a, on a given day? Oh, on a given day, 20 loaves, mm -hmm. some pizzas. We'd come home from school, and we'd eat a pizza before a meal. We, we, we ate pizza before it was ever known in the country. If I'd known that, why the millions of dollars are being made <laughs> with pizza today. Yeah, yeah. We used to sell them for 50 cents. Or she'd give them away, but mostly to people. Mm -hmm. She got to be well known around there. People come up when she was baking. The day she was baking, they'd happen to go by and <laughs> grab a, a loaf of bread. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, you said the, who Bill Hotelling was it? Who used to George, George Bill's George? George's father, George Hotelling. He would. Uh... He would stop speak to her, say, hello, Ma, how are you? Shoot the breeze, and then he'd go home with a loaf of bread or two. Mm -hmm. And you said to me at one point that you used to get together with uh, relatives from Green Island. On oh, Saturday. yeah, we used to have. How did you arrange that sort of thing? Well, there was no arrangement. They, they come out, we fed them. <laughs> Especially during this time of the year when the harvest was, the garden was being harvested. My mother was, had a green thumb that was out of this world. Mm. We used to, my father and I used to spade it, bought it pretty near an acre, and she planted it. She was in charge of planting it and watering it, mm. and we'd help her weed. Boy, she could grow anything. I've seen a pile of peppers four feet high in the, in the lawn, green peppers and tomatoes and We'd can, she'd can, make her own tomato paste. Now you buy it. She made her own. She had boards that she put legs under it. My father put legs under it, and she'd dry her tomato, put her tomatoes on there, and dry it. Take the seeds out, she'd put them through a colander, and put the paste out there until it dried, and then she'd can it. And we had all our ingredients. We didn't have to go to the store for anything. We had tomatoes, cans of 300 cans of tomatoes, quarts. Wow. She used to put peppers down in, in, in vinegar, you know, mm -hmm. and have antipasto. <laughs> they had it. I tell you, Dennis, they, they knew what they were doing. They weren't. They didn't, couldn't read nor write, but boy, they could manage. They had things, well, God gifted them with knowledge that they didn't pick out of a book. 
They were very religious people. They knew the Bible frontwards and backwards. My grandmother, God love her, she was a grand woman. She brought half of Boysville into the world. Dr. Jocelyn wouldn't go to deliver a baby without her. He'd call her right away. He'd go pick her up. She was a midwife. She, oh, she was a grand person. She could be a saint today. Uh, well, how, how did that work, Mike? He, he, when he had a, a baby to deliver, why would he call her? Because, of because she was, uh, she did it over in the old country. They didn't have no doctors there. A baby was born, and the woman, my aunt, would have a baby, and she'd be down in the, Mike Rickey's grandmother would be down in the store a couple hours afterwards working. They, they had their own. I can't understand it today. It costs so much to bring a child into the world. And they did it just as easy as pie. You didn't hear of any unnecessary accidents or anything like that like you do today. Yeah. Grandmother used to make rag rugs in the winter time when she couldn't go out. I still got one of them in, inside. Yeah. yeah, I saved it. Oh. We gave her the people to bring rags, and she'd make rugs, big ones, little ones. She she was out of this world. On a Sunday afternoon, Mike. How how many people would you have for dinner sometimes? Well, it's hard to say. We could have from one, from our family up to 15 more, 20 more. Is that right? Sure. She fed everybody. Well, it was a, it was a, a custom of ours. If you came to the house, the first thing they'd do is get a bottle of wine and they'd put some, some food in front of you, whether you just got up from the table or not. They, they were awful strict about that. Mm -hmm. If you didn't eat, you didn't sell them. You had to take a bite. No matter who came, if they stayed there 15 minutes, they had something to eat and drink. We used to make five barrels of wine a year. We did? Sure, 50-gallon 50, 50 barrels, 250 gallons of wine. My father had five rows of grapes. The blue grapes, and then he—he—that was his pet. He—he he used to take care of them. Then we'd pick them and run them through the wheel, the grinder, and let them make the wine, stay five days, ferment and boil over, you know. And then we'd put it in this press. Mm -hmm. I'd have to go down and wind the press up for him. Oh, we had, we had everything. We used to make root beer, wow. three cases of root beer for the kids. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, we used to make soda. And how did you make the soda? Do you recall? Well, you get, you could buy the, the ingredients, and geez, I wish I could stop shaking. Don't worry about that. You're doing fine. Uh, then we we get the root beer and the yeast, and you make a. We had a a hand corker that you we buy the corks, mm -hmm. and it would the cork bottles. You we'd squeeze it down, and then the the cork would close, and we'd put it down cellar and have three cases of soda. We had everything. Yeah, yeah. We had the life. You know, now Mike Rickey says sometimes people would come over to cut wood. Oh yeah, his father what? got a crosscut saw. He had a Model T Ford. We'd put a belt on it, and you know, uh, one of them bench saws mm -hmm. that would rock mm -hmm. had a chain on it. You put a tie on it, and then you shove it up, and that that would cut off the block. And we'd, we'd make a pile of that, and then we'd split it and uh, pile it up in the shed. Then during the winter, I used to have to take it. One of my chores was to bring the wood and throw it down the cellar window. 
so that the boiler could, we could have it for the boiler. Mm -hmm. And we had wood ties. My uncle was foreman. We tell him we wanted to load. We, he'd dump it in front of the, the, the house by the railroad track. We'd have to go get it, bring it over the road, take it in the backyard and pile it up until we got time to cut it. You ought to see me on the back end of a cross-cut saw. I was about nine, ten years old. My, my father would say, pull. I'd say, well, I can't pull anymore. <laughs> Gee, and he used to sharpen them saws, cross-cut saws. He was talented. Take a, he had a, a tooth setter that you set them, you know, you had to set them just right. He, he had a tool that he would use. Then he'd get files, sharpen them up, and we'd go through the ties till we hit a stone or hit a spike or something. Yeah. Then we'd have to stop and point them up again. Yeah, yeah we had an interesting life. Now, like you're talking about uh, burning wood. There was coal around then. People were burning coal. Oh, yeah. We used to get up on the train, but it would coal go by, chestnut coal. Mm -hmm. And kick it off <laughs> along the track, and then we'd go and pick it up mm -hmm. in pails. Yeah, we had coal. We had soft coal. I remember my dad would buy chestnut and then pea coal. You put the chestnut to get the big flames and put the pea coal to bank it overnight. Uh -huh. He was an ace with the boiler. Uh -huh. Boy, we, we stayed warm as kittens. He used to work from 6 until 6, 6 at night till 6 in the morning. He used to be home. My mother would have a big pan of fried potatoes and meat for him. Then I'd get up and go to school. He'd say to me, eat. I'd have to have some potatoes with him. I, I, that's where I got to eat fried potatoes and toast in the morning. At that time, from six to six, he was working where? At the Albany Casting. At that time, what, what sort of work did he do there? He was night watchman. He had a clock. He had to go around for fire protection. Mm -hmm. You have to go to these different keys, and you'd have to punch the t clock, and it had a dial on it, a paper register dial that you would put in there. The, mm -hmm. the boss would put it, put in there so that he went around and seeing that nobody was there. We used to find hobos them days sleeping in the sand that they used to make molds out of. Sometimes I'd go over and help him when he wasn't feeling good, when he had too much to drink. I'd stay over there at 12 o'clock and go around, punch the time clock for him while he took a nap. Yeah. How old were you at that time, Mike? Oh, I was young, 12, 15, 14. When I was 14, I worked on a section gang during the summer with my uncle, Mike's grandfather. He had the section on the D&H. Mm -hmm. I worked on both years, 14 and 15. Made 34 cents an hour. Uh, and mostly Italians on that crew at that time, too, right? Well, no, we had a few. We had Gifford, Jay Gifford, his father, and Schufeld, and there was one other guy, I can't think of his name, and me. There was five of us on the crew. Mm -hmm. Now, Mike, when you were younger, when you're talking about this time of your life, obviously there was no television. No, and we had a, we bought a radio at, at Water Kent. We got a cabinet at water can. I finally got them together. Mm -hmm. And we used to listen to that. We didn't have TV or anything them days. Hell, we didn't have TV till I was old. Mm -hmm. I was married before we got TV. I got a Emerson table model up at Aldemont. Mm -hmm. I remember my first one. Well, what, what did, my point in asking that question, Mike, is what did you do for recreation at that time? 
Oh, we, we used to get together with the kids on, on the street, play baseball with a, with a ball if we could get one. If not, we'd roll some old stockings up and go across the field or roll us across the track. And then we had parties at home. We'd get together and play cards. We played pinochle when we were young. Played all kinds of cards, and we were baseball fans. We, we'd li we'd listen to the games. Yeah, we had entertainment as such as it was. Then we we'd go to the church suppers, work for the church, help put on suppers and spaghetti suppers. And we'd get together at card games. The church would sponsor a card game, make some money. We'd go there. Yeah, we, or I would go down the street where the park was. Remember where the park? Mm -hmm. And we'd sit around there till late nine o'clock, and then we had our orders to get home. So we'd go up the, up the road, up the track, and get home. So we were there by 9 o'clock, mm -hmm. so we wouldn't get into trouble. But we, yeah, I finally worked enough to get a second-hand bicycle. To move around. To move around, yeah. pedal papers. I pedal papers for 8 cents a night, 48 cents a week. And I saved every bit of it. When I was 18, 19, I had a thousand dollars. Amazing. Now you, you mentioned uh, Down Street, Mike. What's the term Down Street, Up Street? What is that? Well, mean? we lived about a five city blocks from the park, from where we lived. Uh, you, you know where you go to the library. Mm -hmm. That street was all ours. We lived on the first house on the hill. There was one on the bottom, and another one on that. Well, the next one was our house. And we had people that come over. With lo local neighbors used to come in, and when they knew we had spaghetti, they'd come over, and my mother say, "Come on in, have a dish of spaghetti." Mm -hmm. She had enough for. For everybody, she had a saying. She, she'd always have enough for supper in case the Lord stopped in to, ha to have a meal. She meant some individual, some hobo. Mm -hmm. She had enough for him to come in, and that was her way of saying, "I'm paying the Lord back for the abundance that we had." Mm -hmm. She was a great person. So you recall hobos in Boryville? Oh, yeah. Well, they had a smart. Remember you hearing people say when they go by on the trains, they'd have a symbol that they would put by the house. She wouldn't let them in the house. She'd let them sit on the front porch. She'd give them a half a loaf of Italian bread and 50 cents to go down and buy bologna and make her own sandwiches. Yeah, we had a guy, my father gave him, it was in the winter time, we gave him the shoes, and I got a, he had an all overcoat that was good. We gave it to him. We felt sorry for him. They stuck around the foundry. He, he had them there by the, where it was warm in the boiler room. Mm -hmm. And when he went home, he brought, we found the coat and the shoes on the porch. He said he didn't, he couldn't take them because people would think he had too much money and he wouldn't get fed. You imagine that? I can't. <laughs> it's, it was, there were some pretty decent people, some well-educated people who came by them days. Now, Mike, where did you go to school? I went to Voorheesville. Okay. I walked, I walked from there all the way up to where the elementary school is now. Mm -hmm. Used to be a three-room schoolhouse there when I got, until I graduated in 28. Or I got out and went to Del Mar. Mm -hmm. I went to Del Mar for four years. Then I went to work at Duffy Mott. Duffy Mott came in with its prune juice and apple cider. And what did you do at Duffy Mott? Maybe you could 
Tell us what. Tell well, us. I did a little of everything. Like what, for example? I coopered barrels. Now, see, people, younger people today won't know what that is. What does that mean? Well, you, you, we used to buy whiskey barrels. Mm -hmm. Off the, the company would buy the barrels that they used to put whiskey in and ride them around in the ocean to make them stronger. And we'd buy the empties. Some of them had two, three gallons of liquor in it. Some of the guys there used to look for them. I wasn't the regular cooper. I, I Cooper helped. And it had hoops on. You're seeing a barrel with hoops on both. They were, they had it. Both sides were parallel, so you'd take a hammer and a hoop, iron, and drive them home, and put steam in them, wash them out, steam hose in them, put water in them and steam them and get them real nice and clean, and roll them down, and then they'd put vinegar, or they'd, they'd send vinegar to the, in barrels to the stores. Them days they used to sell it by the gallon in, in the stores. They'd drink, buy a barrel. Now, then afterwards it came to put the bottles. A little later on, we used to bottle them mm -hmm. and send them in case goods. Some of them still liked, in the countries, they still liked the barrels. Mm -hmm. So we, we used to ship the barrels to them, and then they would sell it to, you'd go in with a gallon or a half a gallon or whatever you wanted to do and made your purchase. You tap it? Is that what you would do? Yeah, you had a wood, wooden tap. It was long like that and had a little thing in the end. We'd turn it, it would open the hole up and it would run. All right, so you coop it at the, uh, at the side of the oil, did you do? Oh, I worked. I did maintenance work. I, well, I got to be shop steward mm. and I was the top man on the totem pole, wherever they had it. If my job wasn't work and that day, I'd have to go fulfill another job that a guy, so I got to know just about everything. I got to be a handyman. If a guy was missing from a labeling machine or the shipping room where we used to load trucks, I'd go over and help them load trucks, check them on, unload freight cars of empty glass, barrels, everything. Mm -hmm. It's just a handyman. Mm -hmm. I was, it got me to be pretty valuable to him. I, I enjoyed doing it. I, I didn't do the same thing. I wouldn't bid a job unless it was, and then I'd, I'd have a different job every day maybe. Mm -hmm. And it broke up the time. It sounds nice. What about the, you talked about to me one time about the, uh, the Italians in the village at that time not being the favorite people. Well, we weren't, you know the attitude. Well, the spaghetti benders would tell you, not all people, I could say, you know, we were discriminated against by a certain few, like they, it took a time. My cousin Charlie, Charlie, Mike Ricky's father, the first one accepted into the fire department. They didn't accept Italians or, or Catholics. He broke the barrier. Hmm. And then we went in. I've been, I served 43, 42 years. You see that plaque I got out there? Hmm. We broke, we broke in pretty good. We, we made a name for ourselves. We behaved ourselves. We didn't go around getting into fights or anything like that. We, my father was a, a be by yourself. He didn't go very much. He, he had his wine. He'd stay home and work in the garden and take care of his grapes. We, we used to hire a guy they used to call Club-footed Jimmy, he was club-footed. You ever see a guy club-footed? Mm -hmm. He used to drive like, he was a mechanic and he'd drive like a beam. He had a Ford, Model T Ford sedan. If we were invited to a wedding, we'd hire him to take us. And he'd, we'd take him in and he'd, he'd be fed just like us. When we go to Green Island or Troy or 
wherever we had to go to the cemetery, if we had to go to a funeral, mm -hmm. our people believed that you should be represented. They were very clannish about that. If one of our relatives died, we had to be sure and pay our respects. Mm -hmm. So we, we would hire, till I got a car when I was 19 years old, I got a Hauptmobile, 1931 Hauptmobile, with some car, mm -hmm. mechanical brakes. Yeah, there's a lot to tell, Dennis, but as I say, uh, at my age, you got to prompt me. <laughs> well, you're doing great so far. <laughs> now, what about the, um, um, the Oddfellows Hall? Did you ever go to that? Did you see more? Oh, yeah, we went to, we, we, when we could get the money, 10, 15 cents, on Saturday night, we go to movies. What do you mean when you could get the money? Well, there wasn't much money around. But my mother, she was, my father would give her his paycheck. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, pay the taxes first and then we eat next. Mm -hmm. He was a true, in fact, I, I want, when I come home from the Army, I wanted to take my mother with the money I had saved and take her over to see her sister because I had seen her when I was over there in Italy, and she says, no, I'm not leaving this soil to go over there for no money. She said, this is my home, America, right here. Wow. And I'm glad we got their citizenship papers. They couldn't talk, but we taught them enough to, we made them practice enough to sign their name, so when they went up, to, they could sign their name for on the certificate. We taught them that, and my father and her. My father could talk good. Okay. Mother was fair, but she was busy all the while, but she could make you understand. She'd go and do the grocery shopping, and you didn't dare jip her in money. <laughs> now, where would she grocery shop? Well, we went to Albany Carpet Bag, down on Madison Avenue, hmm. to the Italian stores. We'd buy a 20-pound box of spaghetti, four gallons of oil, olive oil. We bought alcohol. 90 proof or 180 proof alcohol to make our own liquor. We we were handy people. And how'd you get there, Mike? What, what, local train. We had the Aldabon local. Mm -hmm. We'd run t two or three trains in the morning, one at noon, come home at one o'clock, or they would turn around at Aldabon. That's what they call the Aldabon local. Hell, we had sleepers going from Albany to Binghamton. Big trains with sleepers, mm -hmm. just then they'd go over into Pennsylvania from Binghamton, they'd go into Pennsylvania. We had, the railroad was busy, d &H was one of the best railroads going. Had freight trains coming from Pennsylvania with coal, as I say. We'd hop on, we'd see one with chestnut heaped up, we'd kick it off with our feet, then go pick it up. Two or three pails kept us warm. We used every trick in the book. Now, a lot of people don't know how important the railroad was at that time to go from Voorheesville into Albany and back. Oh, gee, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law worked in the roundhouse in Oneana. They lived in Oneana. That's where I got married. And he, she had a pass. They were still running locals when she was there. And she'd go in. Instead of hanging around the house, she'd grab her pass and go into Albany and pass away the time. Then when my son was born, she used to take him in on the train when he got to be old enough so she, she wasn't afraid of losing him. Mm -hmm. And, oh, the train, I went to school first two years to Del Mar on the local. We'd buy a monthly ticket and we'd get the train at 8 o'clock or a little after 7. And we get down there and walk over Borthwick Avenue to school. Then I'd walk home when I played basketball. There was no train, no bus after 12 o'clock, so I'd walk home in the wintertime just to play basketball. Uh, from Delmar? Yeah. I used to get picked up sometimes because mm -hmm. the driver of the last bus that went in, he used to, at 12 o'clock, if I was out there, 
he'd, he'd pick me up and drive me up to the corner in Warsville, and I'd walk home. Now, Don Lintley said, uh, he asked me about, oh, having money. He said, he said the Warsville were only two kinds of people. He said there were poor people, basically, or just ordinary people, and then there was the business people. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Well, that's what, just what, about all there was. We didn't have very many. But we, did, we haven't got today people with what I call political pull or rich people who could do something for the community. Mm -hmm. Like this new superintendent of the school, he got a million dollars. He, he was smart enough to get a million dollars for the asbestos relief. Mm -hmm. The other guy didn't think about it, but he found a million dollars that's going to come into our district. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean. We didn't have... We had old B. Vunk at the mill, Bloomingdale's that you mentioned in the book, that were, he was a bootlegger, he was wealthy, but they, they weren't, they didn't do things. Well, Mike, talk about, you know, I wrote, uh, I've, been, I've been in correspondence with Fred Bloomingdale. Have you? Well, not, well, not him, but his son. Frank. That's his son, yeah. So I said to Frank, I said, gee, people have been talking about your father being a bootlegger. So he says, I'm not going to tell any stories to somebody who writes books for a living. <laughs> well, did he say that? Yeah. Well, <laughs> Frank, Frank is a funny guy. Is he? Oh, yeah. He had a brother that was a little bit better, Bud. Yeah. I don't know where Bud is. He's around here somewhere. But Frank is retired now, and he's up in Syracuse. Yeah, yeah. When you say funny, you mean what? You don't have to... Well, he was straight. He was on the up and up. He wouldn't want his father to know that he was a bootlegger. He didn't want anybody to know his father was a bootlegger. Well, although he, he used to have Lincoln cars, go to Canada and come down with a load, then he'd get picked up and he'd pay so much to get out. Everybody knew it. Hell, he, they were selling it up until way late. So, who, who, I mean, people knew about it then? Oh, sure, we all know about it. You, know, you can't keep them things quiet. And he was a, Fred himself was a happy-go-lucky guy. He'd go to the grill and live it up. Yeah, we had, we didn't have very many influential people, churchgoers in the Presbyter Presbyterian church, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. We had a mission church for a long time. My mother would go every day if she could. She had a way. She'd walk, although she had a milk leg that slowed her down. But she, they believed in God and the church like nobody's business. Well, you told me once, Mike, that the Catholics weren't well accepted at, at first either. No, we weren't. Not in school or... It was hard. But to be Italian, I can't yeah. tell you the feeling that you get, because I, I believe I had an inferiority complex, because I, I didn't think I was as good as him. I had that, that belief. But I, I got along. I did my job. I played ball. I, did, I wasn't good, but I tried everything. I tried to do what the rest of the people were doing. Mm -hmm. And in high school, I played baseball a little bit, basketball, and I tried to run, but I was too big. 100-yard dash <laughs> almost did me in. Hmm. No, we, we didn't have the, the means that some of the people had, but we were all alike. We were all on the same level. It was a community that... Uh, only a few, like I used to go to Dr. Jocelyn, 50 cents a call. I used to get these pains in the stomach, gas pains. I thought it was appendicitis all the while. I'd go in, he'd say, come on, what's the matter with you now? He'd feel my stomach. He'd say, go home and take some Alka-Seltzer or something. And when I did get a call, gee, I remember I had a real flu or something. I came home from school with a temperature. Jesus, Dennis, he gave me three little pills. He says, go home, get in bed, take one of these now, one when you wake up. 
geez, I took them pills and I, I, I didn't have no flu nor no cold nor nothing. I, 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 I was amazed at the fastness that I, yeah, my, we had like Mary Tork's father had a business. Uh, Mike Rickey's grandfather bought that store where he is now. And they got to be in Italian. They're big shots. They're duns. When they get a little more money than you, then you got to take your hat off to them. Well, my uncle, you talk about that. When I was over in the old country, my uncle walked with me and his wife had to walk behind him. You heard that. That was the law. She had to walk behind him all the time. She couldn't walk alongside him. That was tradition. Wow. Kind of tough. Oh, they are tough. <laughs> they were, they had their own code. Mm -hmm. If you, younger generation, got a girl in trouble, they went right over and took care of it, boy, right away quick. Mm. You got married, you, you misused a woman and got her pregnant. You better believe you were going to make it right with her or their families would fi f find out why. Mm -hmm. There was no yes, I, I yes if or and about it. They were strict in their own way. They, they, they governed themselves on that stuff. We didn't have the trouble you got now, although there, there was some of that going on. You couldn't stop it. You never will stop it. Human nature. Human nature is human nature, and you'll never stop it. Now, Mike, you said earlier sometimes you didn't feel up to snuff to some people in the village, like inferiority. Was that because of being Italian or Catholic or both? Both. How did that come about? Was there a feeling? Well, you get a feeling, you know, guy. You figure, well, I, they they leave me out. Of, they'd leave you out of something. Like for instance, uh, in high school, I could have been captain of the team, but they had a fraternity down there. I was a senior. I played four years. It was my turn to be captain. They gave it to a sophomore who was in the fraternity. They wouldn't let me in the fraternity. Things like that. Yeah, yeah. I could tell you dozens of little things mm -hmm. like that. Hmm. You, yeah. you were used to it. You let it fall off your back like the water on the duck. But we, we managed. We had some pretty, like Don Bluntley, he was no dummy. His, his brother was a smart man smart Italian. We had some colleagues. Mike Rickey's fa uh, father, Charles, was he went to Albany High. He was smart. Mm -hmm. And we finally made the grade. We broke the barrier, and we, we've been going ever since. Now, Mike, did you work on a wagon, uh, peddling ones, did you tell me? Well, no, my uncle had that, and Charlie, Mike's father, had a Larby truck. They used to go out in the country. He had a meat box, put ice in it, and he, he'd sell meat and vegetables. And when I was young, I used to ride with him. We'd go down to Selkirk and get ice. He'd deliver ice to people, buy ice and big slabs of it, and then you'd take a poker, ice pick, and pick it, make a 25 cent size or 50 cent size. Oh, yeah, we, we did everything. We'd, yeah, but didn't you tell me you had a meat market once in Alabama? Oh, I had a meat market. How, how I you, bought my, that was Charlie Rickey's, Mike's father. How did you wind up over there doing that? Well, as, you, as I say, I saved up $1,000 when I was 19 years old. I worked at Duffy Mott, and then they used to lay you off when come Christmas time because the apple season was over, and they'd run until Christmas time, and then they'd lay you off and call you back maybe in February when they got some orders, we'd, we'd stockpile the stuff. Mm -hmm. And if they needed a sh somebody to load the trucks, they'd call us back f for a day or two. Well, my people wanted the best for me. 
And my mother says, why don't you go up and with your cousin and see maybe you can buy that meat market. Well, I tried to do it. I stayed in it three years. I bought, paid $1,000, all I had money. I gave it to him, and then I didn't have any money to do business with. I didn't know enough to, to borrow, go to the bank and borrow. And the first th three months, I was $600 on the books. So I had to borrow some money from my folks to pay for the meat. But I made it. Really? I did. Well, when I, I was, what, 24 when I sold out. Mm -hmm. And I had a 1937 brand new Dodge, $870. I paid for it in the three years that I was there. Then I went to work at Tobin Packing Company, mm -hmm. curing hams and making smoked hams. Bacons. I had the experience and they hired me. So I stayed there until I was 27 years old. And on Christmas morning that year, Uncle Sam sent me a notice. <laughs> and he says, We want to see you in a couple of weeks. So by January 19, 1943, I was on the train wow. down to Camp Upton. Five below zero. Um, now, Michael, let me ask you a question about that. He, he had come from Warriorsville, which was probably 350 people at that time. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you cast into this big world. Oh, what, gee. What kind of change was that? It was a big, big change. I'd never been away from home. Well, yeah, I, I, I went. I got pretty lucky. I joined the Boy Scouts, and I went to scout camp once for two weeks. My father saw to that. My mother agreed, and they hired this crooked Jimmy to come down and see me on a Sunday. It was, I got, I got pretty, I got involved pretty good with Boy Scouts and church, and I was, but when I got in the Army, well, I can say one thing. I had a lot of friends. I made friends. I made a lot of friends, and when I got out of the Army, I went to see him. We were, my company was, our battalion was all made from Long Island on the eastern coast of New York State. We were all New Yorkers except the cadre to Plattsburgh. We were all local people in each little community. Like there was three from, three from Voorheesville that went in my outfit, Otto Schultz, mm -hmm. Benny Thomas, and me. We stuck together. And then nearby, Lens Falls, we had a bunch of guys, five or six, seven or eight. In Saratoga, there was two or three more. In Plattsburgh, there was three or four more. We had 150 guys from the Long Island. And I still keep in touch with a good majority of them. Mm -hmm. We still had it. We had a reunion, September, the end of September. Just Yeah, we had 40, 40th reunion. Wow. I didn't go, of course, but. I've been to a good many of them. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> go, back to, go back to earlier worries, though, Mike. What, what stores were on Main Street when you were younger? What, what grocery stores, for example? Well, there were several grocery stores. There. Up there, right across from Stewart's, there was a uh, Vera Lasher's father had a, oh, what kind of a store? Schaefer yeah. store. And then my uncles down by down the street where the block, you know what the block I'm talking about the block. They had two stores in there, a barber shop, a hardware store, Jocelyn and then Homer Corbin had a, a hardware store. He bought the hardware store. And then Ricky's across the street. And the tobacco factory, the cigar factory next door to them. And on the corner there where the where Billy next to going up my street, the first house, there was an ice cream parlor, Mr. White, whom I peddled papers for. He had uh, ice cream parlor and candies for the kids. He had 
a room in the back where you could go in and get a sunda and stuff like that. Now you walk into that room, and you could, what was in that room? What could you get? You could get a sunda? Yeah, he had ice cream mm -hmm. dips. You get a cone, whatever you had. Or you could take your family in and get dishes. It was a mom and pa affair, Mr. and Mrs. White. They, their son, John White, had the store later on opposite the schoolhouse. In that house there, we used to go from school over there and buy penny candy and all that stuff. Yeah, we had businesses. Yeah. And there was a feed mill, Vunk's feed mill, the coal pocket, Dave Wayne's coal pocket. In back there was a coal chute, a big building that the coal came in. It had a conveyor belt, open the coal pocket, and the coal would go down and go up into the chutes. Then they'd run their truck under it and pull a handle. You wanted a ton of peak hole, they got you a ton of peak hole, you want chestnut, or you wanted the bigger, the bigger two inch coal. Yeah, we had all that stuff. Now, what the, what took place in the Grove Hotel when you were younger, Mike? Anything? Oh, like that? that was... What was still going on there? Was, well, they used to have boarders. They used to serve dinner, and they had uh, people who room and boarded there for a year round, and they had to feed them. They had the bar, which was a nice bar. And then they have gambling tables, a pool table. We used to go in and 17, 18 years of age and go in and play pool, watch the guys play. They had some good guys. One old fella who had retired used to go by down the track. He lived up there where Hempels live now. He used to come down with his stick. He had a, a cue stick that he had bought. He'd put on a show for him. It shows how to play, make different shots. Yeah, we we got around. Uh, did you ever go to any of the dances in the back? Were there, were there dances or picnics in the back at that time? In the back Dance. of the grove? Do you remember any of those? No, we had picnics. Yeah. Baseball, we had baseball. We had a good baseball team. Then they used to have dances. In the pavilion, that it's down now. There used to be an open pavilion like this, had no windows in it, all the way around, and a band would come on the weekend, and we'd have a ball game, and then they'd have dancing and beer parties. I didn't do too much dancing myself, but the that was because we were young. But the people who had dates and like that, they 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 they. When I was 17 years old, I attended bar for Mikey, Michael's father, and they would have parties, strip teas. Bowling teams would come out, and he'd feed them, and then they'd have a couple of dancing girls come in and strip. Yeah, I, I've seen that when I was 17 years old. Uh, Mike, talk a minute about the, the three-room schoolhouse. Uh, there was three rooms when you first started, right? Three rooms, and you had an outhouse. Mm -hmm. One side was for the women, and one side was for the men. And uh, you'd start, one teacher would have two or three grades. You'd stay there. And then you move in. You, you graduate from the third grade, go into the fourth, fifth, into the next room, and then the principal, Bolton, would have the seniors and maybe some seventh graders. And we learned everything in one room. We had our classes and they took, they gave us arithmetic, and geography and English and mathematics. We had it all there. Three teachers, three, four teachers. That's all we had. Hmm. Now some, some younger people don't know when you say an outhouse, exactly what that is. Well, it's just a, a plain three-hole, three-four-hole or a urinal. 
You'd get permission to go there, and if you stayed too long, somebody'd be coming after you. So you didn't fall in. Even in the winter. Oh yeah. Yeah, we we had a pail for water, and if you were bad, they'd send me downstairs. If I if I kick kick the traces a little bit, go and shovel coal on the boiler in the winter time. Take care of that. Oh yeah, we had it rough and ready. Well, uh, Mike, other than your family, when you look around the village, were there people who had an influence on you when you were younger? What people come to mind as, as maybe having an influence? Does anyone come to mind? Not, not in my younger life. Yeah. I didn't, but in my older life, I made friends. Mm -hmm. We had friends we used to go out with. I had a car, Clyde Laws, and Dom Tork, Mary's brother, and several others. And we'd get together when we were when we were seventeen, eighteen. We'd go to the city and have our beer, pick up girls. We we traveled. The best way we could. Yeah. Did you have a telephone when you were younger? Oh, no. No telephone. No toilet. <laughs> they had a two-seater outside in the barn there until I got old enough. When I got busy, I talked my father into putting the bathroom in. $325 them days. Shower, sink, and the, the toilet bowl. Yeah, I, I helped them along. When I, when I matured, I was the first boy in the family. We had, they had four girls, two of them died. My sister was a twin. Then I was born, we had two sisters ahead of me and one behind me and then my brother, who's still alive. And I was looked upon to do the business, take mm -hmm. care of the bank and then when I got 16, I would have to go and do the official business of the house. My sister went to Albany Business College. She worked for $7 a, a week, dollar a day. She used to take the train in. She worked for an old radio guy. I can't remember his name. He got to be very popular, and he died. He used to run the radio station she worked for him. I can't remember his name to save my neck. Then she went to work for old B. Vunk as his secretary and she run, she run that mill for 20 years. He looked upon her as he, she couldn't get to work. He'd send one of his men up the railroad track in the snow with a typewriter and papers and she used to work home. As, uh, we'd get out with shovels and shovel the path so the cars could come up on the hill. We didn't have snow plows. We'd shovel our way back, let, let the cars in and the uh, horse and buggies with the sleighs, delivering milk. My mother bought milk from a Polish milkman. He'd have a 20-gallon or 40-gallon can, and he knew my mother would make cheese out of it, so he'd come over and say, in his broken Polish and my mother in her broken Italian, they'd bargain back and forth. He won a nickel a quart. She'd say, I'll give you three cents. She finally won out. She'd take 40 gallons of milk. She made cheese, pot, cottage cheese, and she'd make cheese in a, and she had a basket that put it in that would drain and we'd have the best cheese. Oh, my mother. Dennis, my mother, could have worked for a king. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was the best damn cook that ever lived. Mm -hmm. You give her a piece of meat, and she'd make, she'd make a delicate meal out of it. She was something else. Mm -hmm. She got well known for her spaghetti and her bread in the village. That's where we had got a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. Used to come up. She was a bird. 
Now, what about the, when the guys would come over to get back to uh, when some people would get together at night? Like uh, Mike Ricky says, sometimes people would come over to play cards. And I know you used to play at Ricky's store all the time. Oh yeah, we well we we played with our uncles. Mm -hmm. We'd get together and we'd we'd play with them. We'd play for wine. We have a boss and an underboss. In other words, a bunch of us were playing, and I won. I got to be boss, and you got to be underboss. Well, there was whoever was playing, there was a glass for each party who was at the game. And then you'd say, I'd say, well, we'll let Mike have a drink. You'd say, and you were the underboss. You'd say, no, you have to drink it. And Sometimes they would drink it between them. They'd drink it all and let the rest, let the rest go skunk. And then sometimes we'd give them all a drink. We, that's one of the highlights of there. We used to play Sundays. We'd play for drinks wherever we, we, we were. Mm -hmm. And we played the Italian game, preschool. You heard Mike say a good many times. What, what is that game? Well, it's with a straight deck. And it's like Trump preschooler and that would be the, the trump card and well I can't explain I haven't played it in so long that well, the aces were one thing and the duels and the trays were another they had different meanings and if you had them cards you, you used to give your partner a hint on what he had to play and oh I got to be Real hectic. We had uncle, my uncle's. My uncle Tony. He he used to bite his his finger if he lost, he, or he made a misplay, or we made a misplay. They got really down and and deeply involved in the games. They were they were World Series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were yeah. They had we really had some hot games. Where did those games take place, Mike? In the house. Oh. We'd go to each other. One Sunday we'd go to your house. Next Sunday you'd come to my house and then we'd go to another house. And we'd, we'd play and then we'd have, stay there in the evening and have a bite to eat. Or we would put out a bite with some coffee or wine or whatever they wanted and then they'd go home. What did the women do? Well, they sat around, crocheted. Shot the baloney, took care of the men and the babies. Some of them played cards. They eventually, when they got 18, 19, the, the girls played with us. We let them play. They just start games. We'd have two, three games going, so that everybody who wanted to play could play and enjoy themselves. Now, Mike, you, I mean, you know from your own life. And you saw some of the things that I put in the book. I mean, at one point, Voorheesville changed, and the old way of life went. Right? Is, is that, does that ring true to you? Well, how many changes came along. And, I mean, the old Voorheesville is not here anymore. No. It's, what, what do you think? What happened such that that went away? Well, we got different people. We eventually got people coming in. Houses were being built. Back in them days, you could build a beautiful house for $5,000. Doris Hodges, or Rene's father, bought a Montgomery Ward, or Sears Roebuck. It's still there by the post office. It, yeah, well, Johnny Holmbeck's son lives in it. Mm -hmm. And it's still there. It, they paid about $4,000 for it. They'd come in and bring the side, the paneling, and they had a guy who set it up like they did. Yeah, we, well, Voorheesville grew. We, we helped it to grow. Then when we went in the Army and came back, we had ideas. I got to be assistant fire chief. They, they allowed us to move around and go easy. It wasn't so hard then. They knew we meant well. So they accepted us. 
Well, I think that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good amount. What do you think? Do you think we got a? Well, I might have left something out. But do you, wait, do you think of something you left out? Well, not much. <laughs> From growing up, the railroad. We mentioned the railroad, the trains that were used to go by. Mm -hmm. I used to get know get to know the conductors. I'd ride it. They used to have what they call a way freight. They used to deliver cars to the different. They'd spend a couple hours here in the morning, and I'd jump up in the engine if I was home. They'd get me, and I'd run the engine, push the lever. We pretty nearly got a wreck one time too. Yeah, we used to switch into the mill, into the cider mill. Then they used to leave cars for the West Shore. They would transfer. They would had a loop there where they could drop cars. And then the West Shore used to leave cars for them to pick up and go on the D&H where they were rerouted mm -hmm. different places. Oh, we were a busy town. Yeah. They had a, over a $2 million, $2 million business in that railroad station here for when the Army Depot came in. They had, they had, oh, but Voorheesville was busy. It got to be well known. They had the Army Depot, it was called Voorheesville, although it was in Gilliland. They were named it Voorheesville Army Depot. Mm -hmm. It was one of the biggest in the world. Mm -hmm. You realize that? I didn't know, no, I didn't. Then they moved it. When Kennedy run, John Kennedy run, he, he promised to People in Pennsylvania, he'd send them business, and he sent them Voorheesville, because we were a Republican town. Politics, kids. He cleaned us out. He moved it right away. There was no reason for him to move it. There was four, 46 miles of railroad in that place. But it's busy now. Mm -hmm. People who own it got different. Woolworth Company in there has got a warehouse, and a lot of businesses have warehouses. Houses there. I didn't know about the uh, about the, that, that was moved after Kennedy. Oh yeah, he promised. It's Eastern PA took Voorheesville, took a good many of our people with him. Some of the had good jobs. They went with it. Now, Easton also didn't Schumann, who ran the founding. Schumann, club, Schumann, he, he went there too. Yeah, he had a place in Easton, didn't he? Yeah, he took some of them there. Yeah. Huh. Oh, I guess the Army Depot didn't go to Easton. I forget where the hell it is. Schumann went to Easton. Schumann went to Easton. Yeah, but where did the army? Depot, but the army depot got moved by Kennedy, though. Yeah, it's in Pennsylvania. I can't think of the name right this. Mm -hmm. It'll come to me. Eventually. No, I guess we covered. Yeah, I don't know. As good as I can. Yeah, I think. Uh, I don't know. Did we run out of tape? Not yet. Yeah. Okay. I think we. Mike, that was great. Thanks you, a lot. You, you think it's all right? Yeah. You, you know, usually. Uh, you know, if somebody has to ask 50 questions, you would just, you would just go into it. Yeah. Well, I just told you about my life. Yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly what I want to <laughs> told you. I knew you could, uh, wow. So in, in, when we put the whole tape together, we might want to use a couple of minutes. I didn't tell you my older life. When I was 25 years the assessor for the town of New Scotland, how was that? The tax assessor? Yeah, oh. 25 years, 1951, till, so from $2, two million to $12 million, this town. A lot of people don't know the, the work that I did. Hmm. Now I do. Boy, I, I really done some work, some work that not too well known in the village. I'm just a has-been, but <laughs> I had a job. To do, and I did it. I didn't discriminate between Democrats or Republicans. I was a Republican mm -hmm. from the word go, and I didn't just because you were a Democrat. I didn't 
raise your assessment. I wouldn't allow it. Yeah. They tried to get me to do it. And I said, you don't want me. If I can't treat this man the same as I'm treated, I don't want, to, I don't want the job. They finally got the message. Wow. But if you were a Democrat and you had a problem, you come to me and I took care of it. Mm -hmm. I didn't go through John Jones or, or the committeeman. And I told all the committeemen, you got a problem with a guy, send him to me. Yeah. I'll take care of him. Not you. I'm not going to let you run this, run me around it. Well, you can imagine what it would be, 12 committeemen in yeah. town. Yeah. They get one of them, give one gripe. You have 12 gripes to take care of, and then it got bigger. So I had to, I had to put the kibosh on that. I used to go to Ken Tice when he was chairman. He used to come to me, Mike, I need a favor. What is it, Ken? He'd tell me. I'd tell him if I could do it, I'd do it. And if I couldn't, I'd tell him. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, you have to tell him. We can't do it. Mm -hmm. You had poor people who couldn't, who had sick children, they didn't have the insurance. You had to give them some help, Ken. It wasn't much. You could knock a couple of hundred dollars off their assessment to help them out for a little bit, but you did the best you could. Now they're fighting over reassessment. It'll never work. It never works. I was 25 years. I went to school. I got certificates. I, w I went to all the conventions where they had the, the best guys from around New York State. We had the New York State Assessors Association. New York, Buffalo, I went to Buffalo, and I used to argue with them. I'd say, you guys, you have a problem. You call the State Board of Equalization and Assessment up, and you'd say, listen, I got a problem here. I don't know exactly what to do. The last word they'd say, well, I would do it this way, but you're, you're the last one who has to rule on it. You're the assessor. We won't take any responsibility. You got to make the decision not us. Mm -hmm. We're not taking it. So I'd have to make the final decision, even though I had a problem. So I didn't call them. I, I'd make the decision the way I thought it was right. If it was right, it was right. If it was wrong, it was wrong. Mm -hmm. But I'm hire a lawyer. Hell, a telephone company took me to court. Is it really? Sure. When I was assessor, we settled outside the hearing room. The guy, the lawyer came to my lawyer. He says, can't we settle this before we go into the judge, the hearing judge? Uh -huh. I says, well, make me an offer. I, I wouldn't give in to them. They thought I was just, I wasn't smart. I, didn't, I haven't got the education that a lot of these people have got. I've only got a high school education. But, so they, they, they settled with you outside, Mike? Sure. The, uh, we, <laughs> We settled. Did you get what you wanted? Yeah, I got what I wanted. He got what he wanted. <laughs> hmm. Sure, I was taken to court two or three times. I didn't know that. But you know, I had forgotten. I did know you were assessor, and I had forgot. I had forgotten that until you just mentioned it again. Yeah, I was.